Greetings, friends. I'm Galen, and welcome to the Gaming Adventure and Discovery Explorers. A show about our adventures and discoveries as we explore the world of gaming. I'm Chad. On today's show... Wizards in History. Let's, Let's explore. explore. Chad, how you doing? Hi, Galen. I'm I'm really good. I'm really I'm really good. Having so it's a Memorial Day weekend as we record this. Yes. And I had taken an opportunity to to schedule, which is like the most critical point, mm -hmm. the playing of one of my favorite games. I could describe it fondly as an Ameritrash board game, <laughs> Battlestar Galactica. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, and those those who don't aren't familiar with that term, so Amer Ameritrash is is just the generally these kind of big massive games often doesn't doesn't have to be made by Fantasy Flight, but Fantasy Flight does a lot of these. They're long playing times, they're very immersive, very flavorful, uh, yeah. a lot of fun fidgety bits, mm -hmm. uh, toy kind of toy oriented things, and and it's more of a game that takes an afternoon. <laughs> like you need yes. to really just leave the whole yeah. afternoon open. You need to set some time aside. It, exactly, and so I had done that, and and we did that yesterday, and and it was so fun. <laughs> I, I mean, I only play that game about every other year, you know, because yeah, right, you know, we have a lot of interests, and mm -hmm. you know, the thing about the Battle Battlestar Galactica in general, and I think someday we should we'll do a deep dive into this, but I tend to go yeah. into it when I've either just gone through a hard time of in life, in real life, mm. or yeah. are still in a hard time in life. I gotcha, yeah. Cause I, yeah, because I feel like they just remind me that things aren't so bad, you know? Yes, it could be worse. It could be worse. And I think the game, the board game does a really great job of replicating that feel. Yeah, yeah. So I, I had invited a, a you know group of people, and uh, you were one of them, and it's Memorial Day weekend, so a lot of people have a lot of stuff going on, so, yeah. you know, no, no problem there. And I had, a, you know, there were four of us, and then one person had something uh, come up and dropped out. Mm. So it was just three of us, okay. which wasn't super ideal but was still super fun like yeah. there's some there's a hitter, hidden trader mechanic mm -hmm. to to this board game you know who's the 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 Cylon. So that's not quite as robust with only three players, because at one point you just know it's one of the three. Yeah, of them. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the way the economy works, it it's you know it, it plays very much the same. Mm -hmm. So the and the best thing about these games, especially these great, I think board games in general, is that they overlap with the, some of the best things about role playing games, which is that the story that emerges. Yes. Is yeah. as much fun. So uh, we have the Pegasus expansion, mm -hmm. and I was playing Duala. Okay. Nice. And I only have so there were four expansions to this. They're all everything's out of print now because Battlestar Galactica, you know, ended like ten years ago. But yeah, I, I have the first, the base set, and Pegasus expansion. And we had Apollo as the as the pilot and Laura Roslin, you know, as the political leader, okay. which yep. was pretty bad. I mean, we were thoughtful about it, and um, mm -hmm. part of this game is is the different roles, just like D anD D or a role playing game. Often there are roles that you want to cover. So yeah, one thing we did notice though that so Duala is. You know, probably the only, definitely the only black woman who is playable in the game, mm -hmm. and and even in the show there are not many others, especially major characters with Lead characters. significant speaking roles. Yeah, Duala is really an interesting character. Like she's really great. Mm -hmm. it, and in the game though, like her flaw, because every character has a flaw every, right. in in the game, is that she's like emotionally vulnerable, and if the morale gets too low, she dies. <laughs> oh, you know, in the show right. yeah. in later seasons yeah. that that was a thing you know I, it's one of those things that i think we just need to always watch out for where it yeah. makes like i could see why that would seem like a great idea mm -hmm. because every character has a flaw and that was a real thing that happened to her and it was really kind of interesting and like a kick in the teeth yeah in the show yeah. when you watched it but now definitely. it's like man that's the only like one of the few minority characters and definitely kind of women character yes you know, indeed women of color in the you know, there's you know you can play Cat the pilot too, mm -hmm. but for that to be part of the thing that carries through with this character, <laughs> in, yeah, into the game was a little yeah. like, uh, you know, it was actually our friend Matt who mentioned that, and I agree with him. Mm. Like, it's yeah, like, yeah, that's they could have made a different choice there. They they could have done something different there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But anyway, it didn't hurt the playing, so we played it. You know, played it through, and mm -hmm. I turned out to be the Cylon. Oh, you evil traitor! Yeah, I was. I was the evil trader. <laughs> and and it was quite ironic because as a group, we were like, okay, morale, we have to watch out for morale because I will die and that's yeah. going to be bad for us. Yeah. But this game is part of what's insidious about it is that, you know, then we lost a little morale and it was really quiet. We were doing really well as humans. You know, mm -hmm. I'm saying mm -hmm. we as humans because I wasn't revealed yet, even though I knew I was a Cylon. But the morale was going down and 
I was kind of slow playing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I was using a lot of scouts to make sure that the the worst crises kept coming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. As I left the fleet, as I revealed myself, I the I happened to have the morale busting thing. Mm. So so the morale wound up as the like the low thing. <laughs> And and if and again, this game part part of the thing in this game is that there are four resources, and so it's like fuel, population, morale. I remember what the last one is: food and yeah. food. And if any of them hit zero, you do die. So the humans die, or if Galactica explodes, you die. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or that. So you know, it's kind of a gr grindy, which can sometimes be a drawback from the game. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we we got all the way through it, and they they were jumping, but that morale was going down, down, down. But so was all of them, because that's the nature mm -hmm. of the game. Mm -hmm. And one one thing I realized is once I became a revealed Cylon, the choices become much simpler. Mm. There's just not as much to do, and and so it's a rich game. It's, you're kind of everyone's always playing in like two dimensions. There's always two things mm -hmm. you're watching for normally. Yeah, yeah. If you're the Cylon and you're not revealed, you you're in this third dimension. You have to think about the social dynamics in a new and interesting way, and like yeah. what are your plans about how do you reveal and how do you kill them and whatever. Right. But as soon as you reveal. You're kind of down to one dimension. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there's only like four things you can do at any given time. Mm -hmm. And and because it was a three-player game, there was no one for me to coordinate with. Right. Um, yeah, which if, yeah. And if you were playing with, with larger groups, there, there's more sometimes more than one Cylon. Mm -hmm. So anyway, in the end, we played with the New Caprica expansion. That was part of the Pegasus expansion, the New Caprica mm -hmm. board. Mm -hmm. And they, they almost made it, man. The humans were evacuating and they were flying. We were in the final battle and, and uh, the new Caprica final battle, which was great. It was every very flavorful. And I like it. Pegasus was burning, but <laughs> hadn't crashed yet. Right, right. <laughs> and and I, I was like, oh, man, they might get away with this thing. Mm -hmm. like, and morale was down to one for a long time. Yeah. And I was like, man, I got to knock these guys out quick. And, and I was able to, so I was able to win. But it, it was like down to the last turn or two. That's fantastic. It was it was so much fun. So and also like if you just take the narrative of it, so it's Duala who wound up being a Cylon. Yep. Who then it, by losing through morale, it's like you're in this final battle, and then the humans just kind of gave up. Mm -hmm. And what would happen in a battle like that if the humans just gave up and gave could, up. didn't think they could couldn't win anymore? You yeah. Know, or whatever. Yeah. And that's how they were destroyed. Like that's. It's a beauty, a beauty. <laughs> An Those awful kind of things they always, especially with with games like that that are based on TV series or other properties, that yeah. I have a, a knowledge of the characters, right? And we've seen them mm -hmm. go through their entire progression. Um, to have the game go like it did in your recent playthrough, trying to reimagine what the series would have been like. Yes, right. If Duala had been yeah. the Cylon, yeah. yeah, yeah, and if the humans just. They fractured and gave up. Like, yeah. Like, oh, it's it's a fun twist. It's fun. And that's what I think makes that game just a joy to play. It's so yeah. much fun. Yeah. There's a few people who weren't able to make it that have expressed interest. So I might schedule it again in the next month or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I really want to do is get the expansions, but they're like 300 bucks now. I know, I right? So yeah. I probably won't do that. There's a lot of things I would rather buy with that mm -hmm. if I'm going to invest in gamer $300 in <laughs> exactly. game stuff. Exactly. Exactly. But rather than something you play like maybe twice a year. Yeah, at the most. <laughs> at the most. Yeah. So anyway, so that was my big my big thing from yesterday. So how, what have you been up to? Anything I, reportable in the gaming department? No, I've had a dearth of gaming. I haven't oh, done man. anything, and it's just okay. It's I'm it's chafing. I need yeah. to, I need to get back in the gaming saddle and do something else. Yeah. Yeah, you do. I was so bummed that I couldn't uh, take part <laughs> in playing Battlestar Galactica because I love yep. that. It's so much fun. But yeah. no, I had other things I had to do. I could see the devil's the devil on your shoulder yeah. saying like, "Oh, you can fit it in." Yeah, right. <laughs> you yeah. can you can do it. <laughs> I could try to do five hundred things in one day. Yeah, you, who needs laundry? Who needs clean clothes? Exactly. I'm <laughs> like, sure nothing would suffer from that. Yeah, you don't need to <laughs> shop or do groceries, or you could just rush through whatever that important thing was. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right then. Well, if you have nothing to report, maybe we can yeah, go into let's... our main our yeah, topic let's roll into it so last time we talked about wizards um it's the the first part in our uh three-part wizard series we talked about wizards in literature um and it was a lot of fun and i learned a whole bunch of stuff but then mm -hmm. we got to thinking about uh wizards in the real world and then my mm -hmm. mind my mind started turning and i was like what's the difference Really? And <laughs> like, where did it start? Because I remember yeah. when I started 
thinking about, all right, who do I think of as a wizard in the real world? I think about people like um, Aleister Crawley, who I know you're going to talk about. Yeah, later. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he I is think, such a figure. We'll get into yeah, him. Yeah, and I think about specifically that that time frame, that 1800s uh-huh. to early 1900s time frame. But yeah, yeah. it has to have started before that, right? You know, in the last episode, you know, we talked a little bit about Cersei and Merlin. Yeah. And, you know, Cersei was a figure, uh, actually both had really really legendary and historic roots and Merlin mm-hmm. especially kind of evolved from there and became part of the, you know, the Arthurian myth and became a figure of a literary figure with so many yeah. stories and that have come up out of kind of rift off of that. But, but mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, history is, is filled, you know, including ancient histories is filled with these figures of, of people who have done like amazing things. And, mm-hmm. you know, we, we had focused on the word wizard. Um, so that just means you know, whiz, the, the root of whiz is Old English, I think, for wise. Mm. So really, these are just, you know, wise people is what the word right. comes from. Right. And most historical records or ancient documents or, or texts, and even modern, will conflate wizard with magician. Yeah. And, and even even witch and warlock um, mm-hmm. and sorcerer. So all these words. So, you know, again, I, we touched on it last week, but D&D has separated those things in a very canonical way. Um, which mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense for the, that game, right? But that's not really the 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 use of it outside of the D and D world, mm-hmm. and and even clerics and warlocks, you know. So in D and D, those get their their power from an external source. But yeah, you know, for example, there's there's it's again depending on the translation, but there are wizards uh, in the Bible, in the Hebrew Testament, especially, but both Hebrew and Christian testaments. Mm-hmm. You know, back to the Exodus story, you know, with so the Israelites were. We're in captivity in in Egypt, and the Pharaoh. There was that whole "let my people go," yeah, um, yeah. you know, thing that I think is, most people are familiar with. So Moses kept telling the Pharaoh, "Let my people go." Mm-hmm. If you look into that story, the Pharaoh has you know wizards, yeah, with like him court wizards, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're they're kind of advisors, but like you know, what you remember is that is that Moses did these amazing things through God or God did them through, through Moses. Mm-hmm. I think that's generally the way it's, that's approached. So a little mm-hmm. bit more like you would call a cleric in fifth edition or in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. But those wizards were matching him, mm-hmm. you know, point by point. Yeah. <laughs> so right. Moses turned, you know, staffs into serpents and these wizards like turned staffs into serpents, mm-hmm. which was part of why the Pharaoh was like, you know, no big deal. What do I, you know, yeah. it's great that you can do that, but so can my people. Yeah, exactly. So why should I be impressed? Yeah. You know, this is where these texts are not probably so historic. I mean, who knows? I, I think there's a lot of opinions about how much of that's history and how much is not. Yeah. You know, personally, and, and I, I am a churchgoer. I'm a, I'm a Christian person, but I don't think that. Re- I don't <laughs> think those. <laughs> I think there is some. I don't. I think there's some license that is often taken. You know, f- to make a point. And, okay. Um, yeah. And so, anyway, mm-hmm. so I'm not saying it's exactly historic, but the stories are right alongside things that are actually historic. You know, there really were, there really was a pharaoh, you know, where there were pharaohs in Egypt, mm-hmm. like that's real figures. Yep. And so it's hard to tell exactly where one ends and one begins. As as I was doing the research on wizards in the real world, that theme doesn't stop. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what is story and what is legend and what's a flat out lie or what is what exactly. they believe but may not have happened? Who knows? Mm-hmm. Like, we'll never really know. Yeah. Um, so I want to contextualize that a little bit too as we get into this. Um, there was another named magician that that was in the Christian Testament that that opposed Paul. His name was Elim, Elimus, E L Y M A S. Okay. You know, Paul was the kind of the main standard bearer for Christianity uh, after you know Jesus died, and he was just trying to convince a, a leader to listen to him, and mm-hmm. uh, the leaders. You know, wizard, his his counselor, you know, was res- resistant and didn't want, you know, was trying to talk him out of it. And Paul essentially was the one who blinded him through some sort of act of mystic, some sort of holy power right, or something. Right. <laughs> so yeah. who's the wizard there? I'm not so sure. He but, cast the blindness um, spell, right? Sure, yeah, sure. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I just happen to be more familiar with the, you know, the, some of those bi- biblical stories, but mm-hmm. I think our you know ancient texts are just filled with it, right? So, so it seems like we go from like the history text, like the Bible, right? Mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. and then it seems like when I think of wizards, then I shift back to what we talked about last time, which was like Merlin and those yeah. sort of yeah. Arthurian legend kind of things. And then, yeah. I, and then I don't yeah. think of wizards again, like <laughs> forever. Like I don't, yeah. I don't think of wizards 
I don't know. It's like uh, the Dark Ages, right? When there were no wizards. You know, I think because that's where we really are, especially as D&D oriented people. You know, one of the interesting things that happened now is that all these orders are trying to, these kind of modern, and modern can be anywhere from their late 19th century to to today, that are trying to draw their history back through the ages. And right. so right. some is more legit than others. And I'm, I, I'm not genuine authority but i but i can kind of i know a little bit about what people are trying to argue because there's mm-hmm. there's always a sense that if you can tie your history and your tradition back through that it's more legitimate um, right okay yeah, somehow. yeah yeah and so the same happens with these occult orders um specifically there's there's one it's called the rosicrucians ooh and then this and this order has a group comes up a lot when you're looking at these figures mm-hmm. um so it's a worldwide you know, brotherhood is how it's how it's described. That really focuses on this esoteric wisdom handed down from ancient times. Mm-hmm. Um, the name comes from the order symbol, um, you know, the rose. It's a rose on a cross. Okay, and it's a real combination of um, occultism, religious beliefs, mysticism, both from Jewish and Christian traditions. And and so the, a lot of the things that we're the kind of the occult things that have come up claim or have a connection with the Rosicrucians. Interesting. Okay. Because it's secretive, it's it's hard to know. <laughs> That's yeah. part of the problem with all these things. It's like because it's explicitly secretive, so there's not always a lot of documentation. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it is thought that maybe Francis Bacon, the philosopher, the English philosopher, was a member. Yeah, and and it had a pretty serious decline. I guess the Rosicrucians did uh, during the uh, Age of Enlightenment. So you know, with okay. the Enlightenment era mm-hmm. there was more you know skepticism and rationalism really came became a, a, a value kind of culturally and so the rosicrucians yeah. you know went into some decline then mm-hmm. it seems like with these things with that with these sort of kind of shrouded in mystery these kind of things since they were like secret yeah. societies right and yep like on the fringes of society it seems like it's easier then for groups to sort of create a connection with these older groups right since there's yeah, no absolutely. there's no solid like this group went to here and all these people did this it's like well yeah i know this guy was a <laughs> part of this secret sect of this group totally. from way back and it seems like it'd be easy for groups to sort of build up a tradition that's really tenuous yeah exactly and we see this all the time like yeah. it's you know, controlling information. And and I think this this could really mm-hmm. apply to any kind of campaign settings or, or character whatever's too. Like so, you know, look at the groups who are trying to people who are trying to control information, you know, and, and who are trying to limit information. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that mm-hmm. that's that's often a red flag, you know, because information is power. Right. And yeah. um and you know, sure there's a time and a place for yeah, there's reason sometimes, you know, for example, if you were in France in 1943, I think it made a lot of sense to not open your mouth too much <laughs> about, you know, if you're part of the, you know, the resistance against the Nazis. But yeah. um, other times it's ways that those with power keep their power is by, mm, or, mm. or, you know, to your point, to manufacture power when maybe you should or shouldn't have it. I don't know. Right? Yeah. Is, yeah. Is, um, and it's a lot easier to make stuff up. I have a question about like the Rosicrucians and uh, in general, as we go forward throughout these groups and these, these people through history is w- what they were trying to do with these powers. <laughs> like, were they trying to, yeah, cause yeah. I, I just read some of uh, in my history, reading up on people um, throughout the years, getting the sense. A lot of them seem to just be like trying to improve themselves becoming hmm. better people or like the pinnacle of what people could be. But then I know some people are like That's a- trying to get demons and stuff like that. Um, do you get a sense? Yeah. There was an overarching theme through these things or like what they were actually trying to do or be. That's a great question. And I think there are a few answers and, and um, so this is semi semi informed answer and semi kind of my just guessing. Sure. I, I think some, there's a certain, uh, if you give them the benefit of the doubt, mm-hmm. there is a certain actual, genuine pursuit of knowledge and wisdom. Mm-hmm. So, how does the world really work? Yeah. You know, it's and and I think this is one of the ways that The Matrix was a really cool movie, right? Mm-hmm. Is that is that we all have this? Now we don't all have a sense, but there are many of us who have a sense that the world that we see and experience is the surface of what is real. Right. Yeah. And there are some philosoph. There are some like legitimate 
you know, philosophical arguments around this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then the matrix, which is pure science fiction, or is it? Um, (laughs) And there's part of the kind of philosophical questions are, how do we all know that we're not just brains in vats? Right. Um, You know, are, are there moments that we see, you know, I think we've all had these moments where you feel like maybe you saw a glitch in the matrix Mm -hmm. or you saw behind the, the curtain of the stage Mm -hmm. or whatever the metaphor is. So I think, I think some of it, is just trying to, and this was my motivation when I really investigated these these things in my twenties. It was like, well, what is really going on here? Like, yeah. we hear all these stories. What's the truth? So I think that's one. Then you can kind of get more cynical from there. And I think there's good. I think all of these things are true. Right. Um, and th- yeah. it, there's a way of a lust for power. You know, if you can control it, if you can gain these kind of magical powers that way, you can get wealth and you can get. Um, you know, you can get more sex and you mm-hmm, can get mm-hmm. more uh, political power so that your agenda can be transferred. And that's not always a bad thing, right? Um, yeah. Often yeah. it is. <laughs> so <laughs> often. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, why do you want to go up in your levels? You know, in if you're, is your care, why does your character want to go up in levels when you're playing D&D? You know, I right. think there's a lot of reasons for that too. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. you know, and then, you know, there's the two branches. Like one is the power that, that the rituals or the magic or the will understanding will get you. And then the other is the power of think people thinking that you have the ability to do these right. magical outcomes. Right. Which is as we slide down the cynical, the cynical <laughs> scale of why do people pursue these things? And the other thing, and I think we see this in, well, from what I understand of Freemasonry, which is very little, I, I, I have not studied this a lot, but mm-hmm. is that there is a sense of belonging, right? It's like, why are you a member of any, group or organization yeah. and often it's because they share your values and you like these people and mm-hmm. or maybe there's political kind of reasons from net, the networking element that that can happen too so so i think there's the kind of belonging sense yeah yeah you know as well so so i think th- those are my thoughts um, okay about it, it, semi-informed thoughts about <laughs> why people are, are doing doing this so so I, I also just it popped into my head i was thinking about um the uh, the other connection I have with uh, the history of the occult would be the movie Ghostbusters, right? Oh yeah, great. Yeah, and yeah. so they're always going to these occult bookstores and looking yes. up looking up information. Tobin's yeah. Spirit Guide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All these sort of these books. Yeah, yeah. And I know that, and it's like even when I think back, uh, the Evil Dead, right? Uh, and uh-huh. they read from the the Necronomicon and yeah. these yep. books. Yeah, and it's like there there has to be a real world basis for these, right? Of all these stories, always, and you know, we're not, I think aliens and UFOs is outside of the scope of this episode, but mm-hmm. it, it, you know, it's the same bookstore we'll have. <laughs> it's yeah, all right. Stuff, it's all the stuff. It's that if only one of these things was true, mm-hmm. our understanding of the world is blown apart. Yeah, right. <laughs> if only one of these stories exactly is true. Exactly, and yeah, and you know, you mentioned the, ne- the Necronomicon, and I think that that might be a good kind of entry here. I don't know that the truth is absolutely known, but that first appeared in the writings of H.P. Lovecraft as as a titled work. Ah, so the, okay. The nec- I don't. Well, I don't know. First mm-hmm. is always a little tricky in these things, sure. but. Um, sure. As far as I know, that that was the first that really kind of came around and hooked. And Lovecraft always said it was fiction, but there have been stories and about this, you know, ever ever since about the the reality of the Necronomicon and whether it's true or not. And, okay. And so I remember, and I, I uh, you know, a friend of mine. Um, David, who's actually often watches the show, um, had a copy of it, and I don't even know why. When we were in high school, uh, mm. or where it came from, or what, and and so it's a copy of one that's in print that I I have a I f- have found a copy of it as well mm. uh, that I have right here in fact, and it's just this little paperback like tour <laughs> published paperback book, but it's freaky. So it says here right in the first. So a like this is straight up. I mean Lovecraft's name is on here, but it is okay. There is no like wink that this is fiction or not. I mean it's either real or it's just a straight up hoax, yeah. right? That people have really invested in, right? And so right in the cover page, this was a, a review of it by Fate Magazine, which I don't know anything about, but apparently there was a magazine called Fate Magazine in the 80s. Um, and it says, the Necronomicon's magic is nothing to fool with, and it may expose you to psychological forces with which you cannot cope. Remember, if you tinker with the incantations, you were warned. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. That's great. Total, and this, again, this book is totally straight up. Like there yeah. is no, this is not, you know, mm-hmm. 
the show is Gaming and Discovery Explorers. Mm -hmm. This is not presented as a game. Right. <laughs> this <laughs> is a hundred percent, at least at, you know, as you look at it, mm -hmm. is presented as mm -hmm. a very serious thing. Yep. And uh, so it's, you know, I did a little digging in, and you know, it's funny. It's got like. Sorry, I'm here reading it. It's been a long time since I've spent any time with this. So it references, so there's Lovecraft references, there's Crowley, Alistair Crowley references, and then there's Sumer, some Sumerian mythos, um, okay. which a lot of these tie into the that realm of mythology, which I don't know a whole lot about, except for where I ran into it here yeah. in, in kind of the more modern stuff. But a lot of these, a lot of these occult thoughts kind of tie into that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And actually here's, a, you know, from... Uh, the I think the Tiamat as a as a creature appeared in Sumerian myth as well. I don't think Tiamat was a multi-headed godlike dragon. I okay. think I think the monstrous element of Tiamat was a little different in that mythos. Yeah, than what made it to D and D, but 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 kind of similar. I think it was a I think that Tiamat is evil and supremely powerful. So as far as we know, as for where this book came from, there were there were a few different kind of quote translations of the re quote real <laughs> Necronomicon, mm -hmm. um, you know, through the 80s. And I think that's where this one came. It was, I think, mm -hmm. 1977, mm -hmm. actually, 1977. Um, okay. This printing was from 1980, so early. And, and I literally just picked it up at a, you know, used bookstore for $3, yep. um, around 91 or so. You know, it's just been, there's a few different versions of it. They have kind of looked at it and examined it. And there's there's a book that was, it's called the Necronomicon Files, published in 1998. These sound like game expansions. I know they do, right? <laughs> they really do. And this is the real thing about this stuff is that it is, yeah. it is like really parallel. I mean, I think mm -hmm. gamers, I think, well, gaming and, and, you know, Gary Gygax, you know, and, and maybe Dave Arneson, but all the way back to at least then we're using these influences oh, yeah. to juice up the game. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the structure and the model is very much the same. Anyway, the Necronomicon files was published and was, the argument was to prove that it was a Pure, pure, pure fiction. Mm. You know, from what from what I can tell, it probably is. <laughs> again, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> probably is pure a hoaxy fiction. Mm -hmm. Though it's it's pretty intense in some spots. And then I'm looking through it, and like somebody wrote notes in it. So this was a used book when I bought it. Oh, right? so okay. It doesn't seem that scary. The underlines and notes and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> when you're talking about the Necron Necronomicon, you mentioned Aleister Crowley. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, yeah. in my head. I think I assumed that Crowley wrote it. I didn't. Oh, yeah, I didn't no. know that the Necronomicon had that Lovecraft uh, connection. Yeah, and Crowley did a lot of writing, but not not the Necronomicon. Mm. It's in like there are influences, and he's quoted, and some of his thinking appears. Mm -hmm. But I I don't think that there's an argument that he actually wrote it or was what the person who came up with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he, he was a voluminous writer. He, he's one of the best known names from that era mm -hmm. of that kind of occult early 20th century, late 19th century kind of occult era. And, and the occult at that time was a, just tremendously popular. Like people were just into it. And, mm -hmm. and if you, yeah. you know, a lot of, we see this now where there's a lot of um, kind of seances and things in, in, you know, media that, that are set in those time periods. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was that was a real thing. Oh yeah, Crowley himself was born um, in 1875 in England, and he died in 1947. Uh, you know, he was a writer, an occultist, um, and a mountaineer. No, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> they go together, and that's actually an important thing. He so his um, his father was a uh, uh, was wealthy, and so Crowley had uh, an inheritance that that he used for a lot of his kind of travels and things. And Crowley was good at great at chess. He um, Began. He adopted the name Alistair. His his given name was Edward Alexander. Mm, okay. Um, and so, as a mountaineer, there's this story where he he was on an expedition to climb K2. And you know, again, I don't know much about mountaineering, but as I understand it, K2 was much more dangerous than Everest, even though it's not quite as tall. Mm. And on one of his expeditions, um, there was some sort of avalanche. There was a tragedy. Four of his fellow climbers were killed. And there's a story that he had advised them not to take that route and that he had ignored their cries for help. Oh. So already we're getting a sense that Crowley might not be the most mm -hmm. great guy. Yeah. 
<laughs> Spoiler alert. Like, uh, and I don't, you know, I think a lot of his, there's not a lot of known facts around this, but the sense mm-hmm. is that he was not a good guy. Yeah. But anyway, beside, beside all that for now, he, um, he joined one of these orders that was derived from the Rosicrucians that I talked mm. about before. So he mm-hmm. joined the, it's called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. That sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> it is, right? And, and this is the whole thing, right? He had a way of just finding the things that sounded the way it was it sounded really cool, yeah. <laughs> like, if it didn't exist, it would have to be invented, yep. right? Right. And so an, a man named Aleister Crowley joining the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn <laughs> is one right. of those things, right? That's how the story begins, yeah. Right, exactly. And it would almost be like, oh, come on, that's a little much. It's mm-hmm. a little <laughs> heavy-handed. Mm-hmm. Nope, but he really did. It was true. Those of us who are um, study poetry uh, might recognize another one of his peers, which uh, William Butler Yeats, mm. W.B. Yeats, mm-hmm. who was a a poet that I like a lot. He he wrote the poem "The Second Coming" and uh, and many others. Actually, I like I like him him a lot. Some of it got a little weird, but I enjoy the little weird. Mm-hmm. And it, anyway, so Crowley, you know, was a part of this order. He was quite young at this point. You know, he wrote uh, a lot of things about his experiences, his mystic experiences, including the Book of Law, which was a prose poem that he said was dictated to him by a discarnate being called. Iwas, A I W A S S, okay. probably not how it's pronounced. Um, so and that's the whole channeling thing is a, is another like interesting thing that uh, where there's some sort of entity is appearing to you, and it sounds like this was dictated rather than channeled, but it's kind of the same thing. Right. And, and there was mm-hmm. a there was a lot of that going on in the like the 80s and 90s too, where people were claiming to be yes. um, channeling wise, powerful mm-hmm. spirits or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and through this is where the his most famous teaching, "Do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law." Which was not a new sentiment, but he really hung his hat on that. Okay. So you know, you know, contrast that. You know, do what you do what you will. Right. Um, contrast that with the Christian "do unto others" mm. <laughs> as you yeah. have them do right. unto you. Yeah. And they're different. These are different lines of thought, right? Mm-hmm. So you could just—I mean, you could interpret that sil- very on the surface, like you know. And actually, this is an interesting way to approach your alignment system, you know, or whatever mm. if you're doing D and D, right? It's yeah. like, well, what are your character's values? Um, because it's not just about doing. Uh, yeah, and I feel like I'm putting my, myself in a position to like to be an apologist for Aleister Crowley, and it's not about that, but it's it's also looking deeper, mm-hmm. um, because I actually think that a lot of these teachings are still, as I understand it, are still followed by people mm. today, okay. and not people who are villains and just want to screw people over, yeah. but people who are like trying to get or you know adopting it as their their way of being. So, mm-hmm. and so the idea is it's not about just do what you want. That is different from what you will. Yeah. So what your will is is making things happen and and um, kind of taking responsibility for consequences of what will happen. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's not just stealing candy or, or whatever. It's about like, you know, recognizing the world and, and just uh, kind of owning your place in it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not the phrase that I follow, but, it, but I get it. Like I, and I, I get where if you kind of right. pack that, that yeah. can be, that can make sense and be helpful for people. Mm-hmm. I have some kind of, acquaintances who are a part of the, some current versions orders who follow some of these things and okay. and they're good people you know they they you know it's not about being selfish and just you know whatever it's about just approaching your life with responsibility you know from again from a gamer sense that's if you kind of shake out different ways of looking at the world that can inform you know characters values so yeah definitely after the book of the law he um kind of went back and forth from uh to the u.s and yeah, you know, and this is during World War One, so it's not that's not as terrible. But he was contributing to the pro-German newspaper, The Fatherland. Right. Okay. Um, but before the Germans got really bad, one mm-hmm. of his followers died in Sicily while participating in one of his rit- his rituals with Crowley, mm. um, and that's where that's where he started to be called the wickedest man in the world. Oh. So that was what the, Brit- the British press okay. was calling him while he was alive. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. And so he was in Italy at the time. Yeah, and so. He was expelled from Italy following that incident. Wow. So he was starting to run out of money here, and he went back to England, and he wrote the, the book of, of Toth, T-H-O-T-H. Mm-hmm. That was um, an interpretation of his tarot deck, um, which was also called the, the Toth tarot deck. Okay. Which I do have a, a copy of, mm. of that, that tarot deck. And it's actually really cool and really interesting, and I've kind of spent some time there during my tarot phase. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things I think that, that has – especially that Crowley is especially known for. Yeah. But he died, you know, he died in 1947. Pretty, he'd pretty much spent all his money <laughs> and uh, he was pretty obscure at that time. So mm-hmm. he had really kind of lost it all. And then really there was a new resurgence in, in the, you know, the later 20th century where he kind of popped back up into pop culture. Okay. 
So he was like on the Beatle, uh, the Beatles Sgt. Pepper's album cover. I mean, there's a lot of people on that album cover. I don't mm-hmm. know if, if you're familiar with it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yep. a lot of people and characters. And uh, Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page bought his a house that huh. uh, Crowley used to live in because or, of, or owned. Because so. of course he did. <laughs> Do you have a sense? Do you know, um, did Crowley in any of his writings state anything like, I'm I'm coming back or any of that sort of, <laughs> you know? Oh, I don't think that was his thing. Okay. I don't know. I, I don't know. So I've got a couple of his books. So I have this one. It's Magic Without Tears mm-hmm. that I read through it. And it really was more about, it really goes back to that do what thou will. You know, it's like, how yep. do you make your will manifest in the world? Yep. So it's less about the ghosty stuff. Mm-hmm. That's interesting because I think, I think my view on Aleister Crowley mm-hmm. is probably pretty common uh, among okay. people that like recognize the name because I view him more in the like the ghosts and seances and all that kind of weird kind of yeah. stuff and yeah. not the other thing not the do uh, what thou wilt thing. oh yeah interesting and okay. I wonder if that's part of the him being called the wickedest man in the world has informed you know history writing this guy's biography rather than what really happened you know the world saying he's a bad guy. He did occult stuff. The occult stuff must have been really horrible and bad too. My sense, though, is that he actually. I think there was a, some of that. Mm-hmm. I think with Crowley, I think there was more. I think he was more abusive mm. in more different ways. Than, I got gotcha. you. Okay. And I didn't. I couldn't find. I didn't research specifically for that. But I think if you start to peel apart that onion, there was more incidences of people being harmed mm. in his circles and back to the secret society stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he was a little bit more in that, like, you know, if I control the information, I control the situation. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's my, as I remember, but I can't, I can't lay my finger on some of that, but I think that's part of where that came from. It's interesting. That's yeah, man. There's so much in there. Like I'm thinking about all of this stuff. Um, yeah. Like in D and D terms uh-huh. and thinking about, you know, a wizard or a, a wizard's cult uh, with someone kind of like Aleister Crowley at the head. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Controlling all the, the, what people know about it and what it's about and yeah. all that kind of stuff. There's, oh yeah. The mind is racing. Totally. Possibilities. And I, one thing I really appreciate, I think Crowley's a great historical figure, but if you, you know, match him with, you know, a fictional figure of, of the Marvel comics, John Constantine. Oh Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he's British also. Constantine's a hero, essentially, and he does real magic. I mean, he's a trench coat, smoke wearing, smoking, like, yep. you know, kind of cynical guy. Yeah. But he really blends his, like, stage magic, sleight of hand, mm-hmm. manipulation of situations with re- legit knowledge of magic. Yeah. And so he blends yep. those all together, right? And mm-hmm. because he's just trying to get stuff done. Mm hmm. And so I think that's another interesting angle of like, and I don't know, again, the details around Crowley, what really happened or whatever, but right. uh, from right. a gaming perspective, I think that's an also an interesting angle of just because they're lying about part of their power doesn't mean they're lying about all of their power. Right. Yeah. And, or, yeah. or or maybe it does. <laughs> like, and that could be the mystery, right? I think <laughs> it's like how much, what's going on here? You know, yeah, how much, yeah. uh, how much is real? Um, exactly. Which I think, Again, a recurrent theme here that, that we've been talking about when it comes to wizards in history is like, mm-hmm. how much is real? I, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. What is what is real? What does real mean? When you start digging into this stuff, a lot of the the magical effects are also they're like divination. You know, it's like the tarot deck mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. And those who have spent time with tarot decks, and I've had a few different waves. You know, where where you pull out the deck and you know try to get something out of it, but every once in a while you'll hit a streak of cards that will scare you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it'll be like the devil and the tower and, you know, something else. And it's like, oh, jeez, I got to put this away. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. pissed at me. Why is my deck pissed at me? What's that mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, I've seen that. I have have experienced that, right? Yeah. And it's like, oh, jeez. And maybe it's probably just coincidence. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a rational person, mm-hmm. <laughs> mostly. <laughs> and so I know it's probably just a coincidence, but... Yeah. Um, well, it reminds me when I was a kid, I would okay, every once in a while go over to my uh, great grandmother's house. And, oh yeah, great. And she had in her closet a a box, a sort of nondescript box, but inside was a Ouija board. 
Oh, man. Uh, and it was not the Ouija boards of today, right? I think it's like Hasbro or, you know, somebody makes them some game yeah. company. It was yeah, a yeah. legit looking wooden board with this thing on top that had a glass uh, uh, eye in the middle. Yeah. That focused the letter and the number that you went over. And so I remember me and my sister and some cousins would occasionally pull this thing out and we would ask questions. And <laughs> I, I remember finding out that apparently in my great grandmother's house, there was a little girl who died there. What? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. And I'm probably what this is must be. I'm like uh, eight years old, nine, something like that. Oh, okay. Uh, but I remember that feeling of being around this board with uh, my three other relatives and someone ask a question and these answers start to appear. And it's that shared feeling of you're moving it, aren't you? You're moving it. It's, it's <laughs> yes. I'm not moving it. You're moving it. Yes, that sort yes, of thing. Yes. But no one would agree to moving it, uh, but it was moving around. So it had, no it had to be this mystical yeah. power, this little girl who died in this house. And it would... We, it would scare us and we'd all laugh and have fun and then we'd put it away and try it again next time. But I remember that being a really big thrill that we didn't know 100% what was going on with it. Yeah. Yeah. In high school, we I think it was even during that uh, Halloween party when, my senior year that we went to and somebody got the Ouija board out. Mm. And, um, you know, and it, it, there was nothing that s stark about it, except we got ourselves worked up. I mean, there was like 25 of us in this mm. room or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the three in the middle, two or three, maybe four people were actually touching it. And like you were saying, they all swore and everybody swore that they weren't moving it. But but it was doing stuff. It was saying something, right? And, um, you know, I have to confess, like, I, that is the one – I am I am not superstitious. Like, I really – in my, like, core beliefs, all this stuff that I'm talking about, you know, yeah. about, you know – ritual magic and all that stuff. I mm -hmm. mostly don't, I'm not, I don't think much of it to be honest. Yep. Really. Yep. When push comes to shove, but I don't, I don't screw with Ouija boards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, Cause I, I don't know. I've just come across just enough. Like I probably, probably when I was just in a, a state where I read something, a bit of a quote or somebody who's was like, Ouija boards will just open portals to things. <laughs> And they will come into your house. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that, yeah. I don't, nope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair, fair enough. Yeah, as you were chatting, I looked it up. And Crowley also was a great Ouija board user. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, it was just part of his kind of practice and he enjoyed. And, you know, and yeah. some of his correspondence was um, talking about using that as an instrument to, to discover things. So. Mm -hmm. And I think about the Ouija board and I think about um, as my life progressed and I, I don't give any credence to Ouija boards or anything like that. It's, it's not, I don't, you know, it's just a fun thing for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I remember as, as I got older and I started along my path in uh, theater and reading a bunch of plays, when I read the crucible by uh, Arthur Miller, I remember getting a sense of, cause that's the one about the, uh, like the Salem witch trials. Oh right, and right. and all okay. and all the girls mm. having this like shared hysteria kind of thing, mm -hmm. and I remember thinking back to that Ouija board and thinking that was a similar experience as what he's writing about in this play about a mm -hmm. people picking up on a vibe and just rolling with it and how it can become something. And I think too that's um, a fun thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about about D and D is how things can go out of control, right? Uh -huh. uh, some cult may do something, and maybe you find out mm. it's it's not real. Maybe they don't have magic, but the hysteria and fear and mindset they've created in people is totally real. Yeah. And so there's yeah. ways that you can play with that in the game. Yeah. Well, and the advantage of a fantasy game is you can... You could play it either way. Yeah, right? it exactly. Be, it could be very real or not. You don't know. It's, you know, what are the rules? You know, mm -hmm. and I think in any fiction, you you want to pay attention to what are the rules of the setting? Yes. And in D&D, &D, the rules are the magic can be real. Yep. And sometimes it's not. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, yep. You know, or then, you know, in D&D, &D, the, you know, the Koa Toa. Yes. Take that to a whole new level. Yeah, where right. Where their hysteria creates real, real gods, mm -hmm. real crazy ma madness gods. Mm -hmm. um, they're not very powerful, but powerful enough to yeah. screw with an adventuring party yeah, exactly speaking of things that 
it's a short list of things that really that I'm superstitious about. And mm-hmm. and I, you know, I know myself well enough to, to frame it as superstition. Sure. But there there's another book in my in my collection. It's it's the book of the sacred magic of Abra Melin, Ooh, the mage. Okay. And so I found this. It was, you know, I bought it um, for 50 bucks at a bookstore here in Seattle and several years ago, 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. It's it's another one of this list of like this is a real straight up book about magic Mm -hmm. (laughs) like Mm -hmm. and it's this book was i think from 1940 something 19 copyright 1932 Mm -hmm. this printing was from 1948 and uh so it's nice it's a hardback and um doing some research around this it it was actually created from manuscripts that date back to like 1608 so so this is like legit old stuff this Mm -hmm. isn't just like you know, a hoax from 1908 or something. Yeah. And though I think there have been different translations um, about it. So it was in German and translated from then, probably around 17, 1750. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it tells the story of an Egyptian mage named uh, Abraham who taught a system of magic. He was supposed to have lived like around 1400. Okay. Mm-hmm. So just kind of dating like where these texts come from. And, you know, not unlike the Bible, these were from translations and kind of put together from hodgepodges of, of things. And so when I bought this book and I, I rebuffed, you know, I was preparing for this and I kind of looked in did some research. But I remember this when I bought the book. I'm like, oh, this is a real thing that's going to teach real magic. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. I was in my phase where I'm like, OK, what is the what's the reality here? Let me learn. Yeah. And so I started reading it. And like it's like step one is like conduct a six month six to 18 month ritual to summon your guardian angel. And, and so it's like, this is like real stuff. Like you're doing like chanting for hours every day. Okay. Um, and I don't even know what all, the, I don't remember what all the steps are, yeah. but it's a whole yeah. big thing for months. And so you have to dedicate yourself for months. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, well, who's got time for that? <laughs> like, <laughs> for one thing. And the other is, you know, again, this is, what I thought at the time and I still do is like, who knows what your mental state is going to be if you are focused every day on this, on these kind of chants or words or whatever, like you're going to be pretty punchy and you might, who knows what your mind is going to tell you, like what's happening. So, so I have to confess, I got a little cynical about it then, but okay. uh, As far as kind of step one, right. Yeah. But the, the crazy thing about this thing is, though, so the step one is you cr- you summon your guardian angel. So that's kind of cool, right? You assume your guardian angel is going to help you out. But, like, but later on, you're summoning the, like, kings and dukes of hell. Ooh. And, again, this is written straight up. Okay. Like, and you're summoning, like, Satan and Lucifer. And, like, and, and so then, but, you know, you've got your guardian angel to kind of help you out. And there are these talismans here. There's all these steps to keep yourself, like, safe or whatever. And it's not quite the, the cliche pentagram circle that I think is in a lot of stories about when you're summoning a, a demon. Mm-hmm. It's not quite that. But but there are these like squares. And it's it's really, I don't know if you can see it here, but there are these, um, the cover has these these squares on it. And these are like these talisman square, like how-to squares of like seven by seven squares with letters in them that really guide the whole the whole production. We have a viewer, uh, Farvignor, uh, chimed okay. in and said that this mage apparently died at the age of 108 years old. Wow. All so, right. So as if he says, <laughs> which if true is insane. It's like, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. who knows, for, maybe. For that era too. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, yeah. That's also reasonable enough, you know, because a lot of the, you know, Noah was supposed to have lived for hundreds of years. Noah mm-hmm. knows in the ark mm-hmm. in, in the story, but that's probably not true. Right. But like, well, 108, I believe that. Yeah. Like, that's a, yeah. a, a believable, you know, and really impressive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, so that this version, there's all sorts of things like you can, there's like magical flight, uh, invisibility, like all those squares mm-hmm. have different applications. Okay. Like that's the thing. All and, right. And one of the things that I read, again, I can't remember what it was. It was years ago, but it was like, don't f- screw with that book because there have been reports of the squares like flowing off of the pages Ooh. or something. Ooh. And and again, like, I don't, I don't really believe that, but I'm like, <laughs> I, this thing is in my house. It's right there. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> yeah. I don't. <laughs> that's really I'm interesting all... because that's, that to me, because I, I don't know, I haven't had anything, uh, any information about about okay. this magician but I have read Lovecraft. 
Yeah. And this yeah. idea of like the squares running off the book and mm-hmm. it's like that is right out of like core Lovecraftian yeah. things. The yeah. symbols change and reality warps. So yeah. I'm seeing this thread, right? This thread mm-hmm. through this the version of the occult. It's yeah. yeah. And really this one would have predated Lovecraft. I mean, I think these I think the this copy doesn't, but I think these the manuscripts, as I understand it, there's like real historical reason to think that they're quite old. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. likely, maybe, I don't you know, I don't know. Either there was something well the the more entertaining explanation is that there was some kind of underlying reality that Lovecraft was, t- was t- tapping into mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or a collective unconscious or just a human nature the way we're designed to fear yeah. um, or he read it or knew about it, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. is also probably the most likely thing. But I don't right. know. So I never tried to do any of that out of that book. There's still time, Chad. Um, still time. I know. I don't <laughs> think I want to. <laughs> I don't think I you know, and I, I don't know that I've talked about it here, but, you know, and I I, uh, I have just enough, especially as a child, you know, I went to church just enough mm-hmm. to have the seeds planted so that religious horror uh, has resonance with me. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, not enough that it really freaks me out. I'm not, I don't genuinely think the rapture is going to happen. I don't really think that there are devils mm-hmm. trying to tempt us, mm-hmm. but there's just enough that any of that stuff has a little bit more freaks me out a little quicker I got you. <laughs> yeah that's i'm fair. more scared of that than a slasher movie right like, yeah or like you know like blair witch mm-hmm. um i'm totally comfortable in the woods mm-hmm. so like that doesn't scare me at all yeah but but you get a little bit of that like you know devilly religious stuff and i'm like oh i don't f- with that okay oh, excuse me i <laughs> try to be a nice little so i i want to bring up something it says i think we're kind of at the end of our okay of our yeah, yeah thing here because we've talked about People sort of on on one side of of this this uh, topic, the the yeah. people writing these books and whatnot. So I want to yeah, I want to yeah. bring out some someone who's more recent, modern day, by the name of okay, great James Randi. I okay, don't know if you've heard oh, of him, know. James no. Randi is a a stage magician, as what we'd think of as a magician, right? With yeah, 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 great. Okay, okay cool, and whatnot. Um, yeah, and he's yeah. also a scientific skeptic. Of yeah, the, cool. The paranormal, great. And great. he created a a society called the committee the committee for skeptical inquiry, and he challenged these people who purported to have these paranormal powers uh-huh. to come on like in front of a group of people and do these things w- while under scientific scrutiny. They offered a I think it was a prize like a million dollars. If someone could actually perform one of these magic powers and actually do it. But this idea of this society being formed to counter the this occult, I mean, yeah. it's a little different, right? Because yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. trying to debunk people who are trying to defraud people and whatnot. Yeah, people being taken. Advantage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But when I think of it in the terms of D&D, I'm thinking of like, these are the witch hunters, right? <laughs> these are the opposites these are the people who are trying to curb in the people trying to summon these horrible things or right. do this magic but it's and but again it it's a real world counterpart to magicians and wizards yeah well i think that structure is is good and evil neutral i think yeah. in itself mm-hmm. right As, especially mm-hmm. in a D sense but i mean not in both in the real world too yeah right there's on on this one hand it sounds like this this guy is doing good work right it's like okay yes. you're like same with and i think there's a lot of stage magicians who uh have a similar mindset you know i mm-hmm. think pen of pen and teller i think has talked a lot about that and i think he tends to be a little on the skeptical yep he was part of uh, randy's group Okay, great. And, you know, uh, Harry Houdini, who, um, you know, of that same era of the early 20th century, Mm -hmm. was very vocal about that stuff, too. And he was like, he didn't believe it at all, either. And he had that same attitude. Yeah. Um, But, you know, you had talked about it, too, that era of the crucible and the the witch trials, Mm -hmm. where now that's, that's what I would consider to be the evil side of it, where you have people... People thinking they're doing right, but really they're just executing girls... For no good reason. Yeah. And not only girls, but mostly women, yeah. you know, young women, yeah. girls. Maybe because they had too much influence in their community or who knows, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think from a gaming perspective, A, I think it's important to keep these things in mind that if you're 
gaming with a witch hunting, if that's your idea, be aware of both sides of that history. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes the whole kind of idea of the hag is something to think about and be it's worth some unpacking about where that idea comes from definitely, and how much of it is monstrous, which, yay, we want to kill monsters, but how much of that is a representation of just, you know, women who knew how to do stuff that threatened the power of the patriarchy mm-hmm. in, the, in, the, yeah, that's true. in the village. That's true. You know, just interesting things, I think, to always be thinking about. Both sides can yeah. be, probably have been, are, we see it, you yeah. know, are and have been. And and does your game reflect that or honor the reality and, and have fun at the same time? Is exactly. That, is it, yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's the thing. Have fun. You got to make sure that everybody is having fun, right? Yeah. At your table. Yeah. So making sure yeah. that you, you check in and, you, and you're and you um able to adapt and change. If you have an idea yes. for a story and you feel like, oh, wait, no, wait a minute. Someone brought up a point about it. Let's let's yeah. change it or get rid of it and try something else, right? I agree completely. And yeah. I think um, I call it, in our family, we call them uh, our Archie Bunker moments where oh, we realize yeah. that we have fallen behind in mm-hmm. in some thinking or some current, you know, of the evolution of culture. Mm-hmm. And and we mean that usually as a self-critique of the like, oh, I am uncomfortable about this, Yeah, but that's my problem. Yep. It's not the thing's problem. Right. I think in gaming, uh, there's, I'm having these every day. You know, as I research and listen, I'm like, oh, but that thing that I used to really enjoy is actually pretty problematic for some reasons, for really important reasons to pay attention to. Yeah. You know, and I don't, I don't have it all figured out, yep. you know. Exactly. But, exactly. And, and we never do, I think, yep. have it all figured out. It's the adventure, right? The adventure and the learning continues. Yeah, new kind of adventure and discovery. So yeah, I think that uh, that probably wrap us up for this one. I think that's think a great, so? yeah, yeah, great place to wrap it up. So, so what what are we going to talk about next time? Next time. So next time we are going to take this back to the p- a little more pure gaming perspective. So you know, sh- shake us loose from our fancy and D and D wizardry and look at some other kind of game systems about how they handle magic, mm-hmm. and just to have a little to broaden our perspective on that. Yeah. If you're listening to this on podcast, we would really appreciate if you review us on iTunes. Um, five-star reviews are especially appreciated. If you're watching this on my YouTube channel um, and you enjoyed it, please click the like button and consider subscribing. And you can click on the alerts to, to be notified when um, new episodes come out. And so if you want to contact me, the best way is through Twitter. Um, it's at ContClockwise, uh, C-O-N-T-C-L-O-C-K. W I S E. And if you are happen to be watching this live, and a big shout out goes to Farfnor and uh, Kai Kony for stopping by and saying hello in the chat, you can hit the follow button up top if you liked it, and you can get notifications when I go live here on my Twitch channel. You can also contact me on Twitter at, at Zobmi, Z O B M I E. Uh, I go st- have stream announcements there as well when we go live. My channel is all about gaming and stuff and fun times and a whole bunch of different stuff and recording this podcast as well yeah i think until next time folks take care of yourselves and take care of the people that you love game great ghosts and different stuff